you look at everything that's been around Harry and Meghan, for example, yeah. and mm. I don't watch much TV, but mm. this was topical for everyone, right? And having met Harry loosely at Tim's yeah. wedding, involved in rugby, he is loosely, and the fact that they are so topical and so famous, I f you find yourself at home watching the Netflix series and you're passing judgment just naturally mm. about mm. whether you like him, whether you like her, whether or not the media have got a huge part to play in all this. Mm. One thing that does keep coming up, though, is around the newspapers, around his mum, mm. around sources within the royal family, and it's just looks a bit dirty, right? It looks like it looks like a, a crazy, it's a yeah, it's a crazy a setup. When you talk about sources, mm -hmm. like was that a thing? So you'd have inside sources, and and what were they saying? Were they saying not like, this is going to break, or you need to be here at this time? And yeah, absolutely. because it's very invasive, isn't it? And people talk about wanting to be famous, and mm -hmm. well, yeah, my mates say when we were younger, oh, I'd love to be David Beckham, or mm -hmm. I'd love to be Leonardo DiCaprio, and mm -hmm. when actually. You watch the Harry and Meghan doc, just to name one thing, there's a load of other stuff out there. You're thinking, fucking hell, it's pretty invasive. It's it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty dirty in terms of how you go about your life and how you're having to deal with them, mm -hmm. different things. And you're, I don't know what part of the chain you are on that, but you're making a living by mm -hmm. trying to get a story or the photographer's trying to get a picture. I just think it's, just think it's very topical. It is. But being parents and we mm. work loosely in the media, mm. we're nowhere near as famous as these people and we never mm. will be. Hopefully I might be. <laughs> never will be, but yeah. because of the Harry and Meghan stuff and the stuff that they've gone through, a couple of questions in that is around the sources element and mm. the changing of landscaping uh, of that and also, what do you think of Harry and Meghan? <laughs> I know what you're getting at, Jim. <laughs> Look, I could talk for hours about this and at some point I'm going to have to empty my brain onto the page and, and write about it because it's um, it's such a complicated thing and, and like you say, it is a dirty game. It is a dirty game. Fame is a cruel mistress and in Harry and Meghan's case, you know, they've come at fame from quite an interesting position, haven't they, where he's had it thrust upon him because he was born into the Windsor family um, and he had a terrible tragedy to deal with as a young man which I think everybody would agree is horrific and he's clearly really at his core damaged by that and it explains a lot of stuff the way he's been treated in the papers has been uncomfortable I can understand where his anger comes from completely understand that but there is a lot of hypocrisy in there and there is a lot of um, woe is me uh, I can totally everyone can understand where he's coming from with the grief aspect of it and you know anybody who's looked into grief there's a really interesting thing that Elizabeth Ross wrote a book Dr Elizabeth Ross she was a palliative care doctor and she when you spend time with people who are in their last days it gives you an amazing perspective on life and she devised a thing called the Kubler-Ross curve which is often called the, the grief curve or the change curve and right at the, the, the start of it there's blame and there's anger and there's rage and there's fury and I know about this because I went through it with my wife when she lost her mum really young she was 27 when she died and I thought I better be prepared to help her through this because it's going to be difficult for some people the grief curve is over really sharply and you come out the other side. For other people, it can go on for a long, long time. And I think Harry's still in a, a pretty angry cycle of the grief curve. And that's why he's getting so much therapy. But that blame and that anger, you want to find the devil horns in the tail who you can pin it on, you can blame. And the press have been a huge intrusion in his life. And, you know, the press might disagree with that. When I was there, I remember everybody loved Harry. Right, that and that seems to be lost somewhere. I don't know where it went so horribly wrong, what the precise moment was. They mentioned but, it in the dock a little bit, yeah, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, but, I, I just remember everybody thinking Harry was a breath of fresh air and a rascal and a character and good fun. I don't remember everybody. And that's the thing, this notion that you would... Certainly, I can only, I can only speak for myself, and I work with a lot of good people as well. I didn't turn up for work every day going, right, let's ruin Harry's life or let's ruin people's lives. I turned up every day thinking... I want to go and do amazing shit and write about it and meet incredible people and put a roof over my family's head. But that's only me, and I can only speak for me. But on Harry, the, the hypocrisy that bothers me, right, is that you can point the finger at the Sun and other tabloids, and the broadsheet papers do it as well. Um, but at the same time, you've signed a deal with Netflix for a lot of money, and what you're doing is a, a tabloid book where you are telling stories about your family against their will. They are the sources. You've been in, and it is your story, and you're prepared, you're allowed to tell it. But the stuff he's chucked people under the bus with, and that that's becoming, you're entering the same game that the tabloids are exactly. in. Exactly. So the hypocrisy, thing, like you've just said there, yeah. is, that that's the weird thing. I mean, I'm loving it, by yeah. the way, loving watching it. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, I, I go back to 
one of my best mates who coaches Leicester Tigers, his wife, Ellie, when we were a bit younger, we were talking about general knowledge, talking about the news. She's like, I ain't got a clue. I don't know that. I don't know that. We're like, do you not watch the news? She's yeah. like, why would I watch the news? It's like death and destruction and terrorism mm. and horrible stuff. I was like, well, what do you watch? And she's like, oh, keeping up with the Kardashians. I was like, why? Mm. She said, it makes me happy watching that life and watching how yeah. these other people live and see, the drama enough, around that. See, fair enough. See, my thing is, Jim, right, I find it really, and it does grind my gears when folks say, why would you work for them? Or why would you read that shit? And I'm like, well, if it's not for you, fine. But don't cast aspersions on other people or turn your nose up at them because it's not for you. I always think, sons like Mrs. Brown's boys, right? Nobody admits to watching it, but three and a half million people clearly do watch it, right? It's For some reason, everyone thinks it's massively unpopular, but, you know, for every person that gives me grief, nobody really comes up and says, oh, I love it, I love reading it. And when it happened, it was, it was quite nice. But on, going back to Harry and Meghan, and particularly the Netflix thing, how you can justify taking all that dough from them while the crown's on, which is telling your story with a bit of topspin and your mum's story and repeating the Martin Bashir stuff, which William had said should never, ever be repeated again because that was fraudulent and appalling journalism, allegedly, from Martin Bashir, how he got access to Diana, how he persuaded them to get that access. Um, and there's been a big inquiry about that. And I think William had said we never this should never be used again or broadcast again. But Netflix have used that to draw us all in to pay our twelve pounds ninety five or whatever it is for the monthly subscription, which he's then capitalising on. And then also there was a, a bit that really bothered me where I think Megan and her pals said, So we decided that we would do our story in People magazine. It's a tabloid. Mm. It's a tabloid. And you know, I, I'm reluctant to talk about it too much because, you know, if they don't want to be talked about I won't talk about them. That's but and you know, Jim, you've asked me. I'm giving you an honest answer. You know, like you say, from my perspective, I never went in there wanting the, to put the boot into the Royals. Um, I keep my personal views on the monarchy to myself, but you know, I, I just think um, he's a confused laddie and he needs an arm around him. But what he does need, he needs a hook? What right, does wind me it? up, right? What does wind me up is the publishers, and I've ghostwritten two books and read pen the legal process, the amount of stuff that gets knocked out of a book, I cannot believe he wasn't pulled up before publication on the military, the, stuff. On the military stuff. Yeah, that's you the just crazy don't, You know, like, we both know a lot of boys in that world. You do not ask mm. how many people they've killed. You just don't do it. It's uncomfortable. You don't talk about it. And um, for him to use that in the book and then justify it and then blame the press, I felt, felt that was uncomfortable in poor form and it should have been edited out the that book. That was crazy. It shouldn't have gone in the book. As simple as that. That's the American aspect to it, it is, clearly, yeah. is it not? And that, he, that wouldn't have happened. But again, you get your yeah. mates to read the book, right? He's done brilliant work with Invictus Games. He had the whole military on his side and I feel that that's tarnished it and damaged it and that's poor editorial judgment. And I think because he's in such a privileged position up there, there aren't enough folks saying, don't do that, what are you thinking, you dafty? Which happened, and sometimes, I, I'm very fortunate in my life to have a lot of people saying, that was a bit, why did you do that? And sometimes, you, you know, listen, feedback's a wonderful thing. You can ignore it or take it on board. Constructive criticism's the same. I think he's got enough strong people in his life saying, don't do that, what are you thinking? Um, and, and that's a perfect example in, in that book. Um, but also, you know, you look at the people around you when, um, when you're struggling uh, and moving to Montecito, I, I wonder who's there and in a position to say this isn't a sensible thing to do. And it's like things like complaining about the size of your bedroom in Balmoral Castle, talking about how small your cottage is during a cost of living crisis. You know, I went to school with two kids who lost their parents before they were 12, right? One of them found his mum dead, right, in bed, and his parents got divorced, and the dad didn't want anything to do with them. So he had his teenage years, like Harry, growing up in a house where he didn't really feel entirely welcome. I've heard him talk about it twice in our life. He's gone on to be a really distinguished guy in the military and made an amazing career. He supported his grand financially, looked after his younger brother, complained twice. And what happened to Harry's terrible, right, with his mum and how she died, all of that stuff. But there are people in the real world who have these tragedies and have to deal with them and don't have the same network of support. And when he, you know, when he criticises the institution saying they weren't there for him, I don't know, I wonder if he's really sought help in a meaningful manner to get it, because I'm sure he'd have got it if he'd asked for it 